I'm now going to discuss how to image as quickly as possible with the Ixon EMCCD camera. So the typical reason you need to do this is you are looking at something alive, something inside what is alive is moving, and it's moving quickly. So this is an example from some cells provided kindly by the Bear Lab, where they're looking at a cytoplasmic uh, protein that uh, moves around. It doesn't matter what it is, really. Uh, it's just tagged with RFP. And if I go to live, you can see it um, is distributed in these puncta. And these puncta can move a little bit as they move from one part of the cell to the other, uh, sort, of, sort of jiggling around and jostling inside the cell. And so if you're interested in that kind of movement or in other kinds of movement, uh, you may want to image as quickly as you possibly can. So how do we do that with the Ixon camera? So um, th there are several things we can do uh, to increase the speed of the camera. Uh, before I get into this, let's just get a sense of how fast is the camera under normal circumstances. And so if we just look at a time-lapse protocol and we just take 11 repeats, if you look here, since we have an exposure time of 100, if the camera uh, didn't have any extra time every time it took an image, this should take one second because there's no interval between, um, uh, there's no additional time for the first frame. So if we acquire things under these conditions, you can see, that actually the spacing between uh, each frame is 144 milliseconds, which tells us that in addition to these 100 milliseconds, there were 44 other milliseconds when something else was happening, and that something else was moving data off the camera. Um, so this whole discussion is going to be about how to reduce that time as much as we possibly can. So right off the bat, there's something that we should make sure of, which is to have the camera in the 30 megahertz horizontal shift piece, which is what it's at right now. So if you had instead opted for 10 megahertz, which might lead to higher signal to noise, and we had done the same experiment under those some circumstances, let's see what happens with that extra 44 milliseconds, whether it gets higher or lower. Under these circumstances, using 10 megahertz, we expected if there were no delay, one second of total uh, time to run the experiment, but instead it took 2.2 seconds approximately. So, so that means that for every frame, there was a, a lot of added time. You can see that between the first and the second, it took almost 220 milliseconds when the exposure was 100. So that's added time to each frame that was significantly higher than when we were at 30 megahertz. So if you want to go fast, the first thing is just to make sure you're at 30 megahertz. At 10 megahertz, you are slower by a factor of three, which is the difference between 30 and 10. So that is um, the first thing that you need to make sure of if you want to go fast when you're imaging with this camera. So the next thing you need to make sure is that you're actually not in time-lapse mode, but in finite burst mode. So finite burst mode runs the camera as fast as it possibly can. Now, it really limits your options. You can only... Uh, do sort of a single plane in this mode. Uh, you can see that there's really not a lot of settings here to play with, but this will make the camera go as fast as you can. So if in this situation you do a, a hundred, um, excuse me, 11, let's do 11 repeats and acquire. If we look at now the difference between the first and the second frame, there's only one one extra millisecond compared to before when there were 44 extra milliseconds. So that really, really helps a lot. So if we were interested in taking 100 millisecond exposures for uh, an effective frame rate of 10 hertz, we're pretty much done. A 1% slowdown from that is going to be fine. Now, the nice thing about this camera is that because it is so sensitive, we can go significantly faster we could actually get away with doing a 10 millisecond exposure and still get an image that is usable. And so then the question be becomes, how, um, how can we set up the camera to make the dead time between exposures of 10 milliseconds as fast as possible? So we already know that we're gonna do two things. For sure, we're gonna be at 30 megahertz. And for sure, we're going to be using the finite burst. And then we'll discuss what other things we can do. So let's let's take a look at whether 10 milliseconds is even uh, feasible as an exposure. So if I drop uh, the exposure down to 10 milliseconds and just snap an image, 
you can see I, I can't really see much. If I up the laser power to 25 and snap an image again, we can definitely see something. So one question you might have is, why would I do this on this camera as opposed to the Xyla? And so um, let me show you what the Xyla would look like using the exact same conditions. So if I go to 10 milliseconds and 25% laser power and just snap an image, and actually let me bin the Xyla to make it more comparable so the pixel sizes are the same. So this is what you get with the Xyla. So you can see that the Xyla, even kind of matching all the conditions to the MCCD, it has a lot of trouble with very short exposures. And the reason for that is that the Xyla has a certain amount of readout noise. The MCCD does, does as well, but with the EM gain, the MCCD crushes that readout noise and we can get these beautiful images with really short exposure. So again, here's the uh, Ixon image, which you can see is uh, dramatically better than the Xyla. Okay, so let's say we have uh, we, we have this sort of 10 millisecond exposure that we want, uh, and we want to go as close to that as possible. So what are our options? So let's kind of see what our starting point is. So if we're in finite burst, we're at 30 me uh, megahertz. Let me just acquire 11 frames here and see how much extra time there was. So you can see that between the first and the second frame, if everything had gone as fast as possible, we would have had a 10 millisecond interval. Instead, we had 39. So there's sort of 29 extra milliseconds that we need to try and reduce. And so what are our options for reducing that? So one of the first options is to crop. So if we uh, crop down to, for example, 256 by 256, and we run the same thing again, again, there's an extra 29 milliseconds that we're trying to reduce here to go as fast as we possibly can. If you crop, you can see that that goes down to just one millisecond. Now it does so at the expense of the field of view, but that is kind of a very uh, dramatic improvement. So cropping is, uh, once you've done the other two things, the finite burst and making sure it's at 30 megahertz, cropping is really something very useful. Now, interestingly, what, what matters in the cropping is just the second number, which is the height of the crop. And so um, what you can do, keeping that in mind, is keep uh, the image as wide as possible and just crop vertically. So let me show you how to do that. So if you go here, um, again, if we crop vertically, that's what's really gonna matter. The, the width doesn't, doesn't affect the speed. So we can do something like this to get it down to 256 approximately. Um, we can do something like that. I'll press enter to confirm this area of interest. If I snap an image, let me just make sure it's the right size. So this, we're, we're getting quite a bit of information. And if I now hit acquire, you can see that the speed is the same as if I had cropped it 256 by 256. So really cropping can have a, a, a dramatic impact on your speed and you only need to crop in the vertical dimension. And you can do so dynamically using these AOIs, uh, this AOI tool here. Uh, if you wanna go back to non-cropped, you can just go here and then snap another image. Another thing you can do to improve the speed is increase the binning. So uh, what binning does is it combines pixels, so it reduces uh, your resolution, it increases your signal to noise, uh, and it can also increase the speed. So for example, if I have binning off and I'm at 1024 by 1024 and I acquire an image, uh, excuse me, 11 images in the finite burst protocol, you can see that between the first and the second, I expected 10 milliseconds but I got 39 milliseconds between them, which means I have an extra 29 milliseconds, which came from reading out the camera. If I switch the binning from one by one to two by two, and I acquire this again, the expectation is that that number will go down. And so let's see between the first and the second frame, it took 20 milliseconds. So instead of 10, it took more, it took 10 milliseconds more, but before it had taken significantly more than that. Um, so we dropped, uh, that extra time between frames uh, by doing the binning. So that's um, that's that's sort of one more thing uh, that we can do. Uh, let me show you uh, one, one final uh, control element uh, 
which is the in in the advanced mode something called the vertical ship speed and vertical clock voltage and actually this is not set currently to the default position because i forgot it at a position where it, it, it leads to higher speeds the default position for these two parameters are a vertical shift speed of 2.2 and a vertical clock uh, voltage that's normal um, but if you reduce these to 0.6 and to uh, and increase the vertical clock voltage to plus one, you can gain some speed. So here we're going in the opposite direction. I took them back to normal, and so we expect that this will take longer. Um, let's go back here and just hit acquire. This is this 1024 by 1024, and you can see that between the first and the second frame, we had a 10 millisecond exposure, but it took 42 milliseconds before we did the second one. So there was an extra 32 milliseconds. If I drop this to 0.6 and I increase the vertical clock voltage to plus one, and I try the same thing, you'll see that that number will be smaller. And indeed, you can see that it went from 42 to 39. So this is really a small effect. It can you know, help you by about 10%, but when you're pushing the limits, uh, that can be um, that that can be sort of a final adjustment that you make. Now, now you'll notice that of all the things we did, really the ones that mattered the most were the 30 megahertz and the cropping. So if we 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 put that into to good use, we can go here and just crop to something that's around 256 by 256. So a little bit smaller than that. I'm going to hit enter. That'll crop it. And now if I say acquire, you can see that there was very little, little extra time, essentially one extra millisecond between frames. So uh, a final note that's important, uh, because of the speed of the spinning disk, uh, you want this number, your exposure, to be a multiple of 2.5. 2.5 is really the minimum exposure you should use, and it's very hard to actually get down that 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 low with something bright enough that you can actually image it. But if you have to, uh, there is that option. Um, you need to make sure your exposure time is a multiple of, of 2.5, and the typical lowest exposure time that you can use is 10 milliseconds. Below that, while it's technically possible to use 2.5 and 5, you tend to have a lot of artifacts. Um, so to recap, uh, how do we ensure that we can go as fast as possible with the Ixon camera? We want to make sure we're in a finite burst protocol. We want to make sure that we use uh, cropping. So instead of the default 1024 by 1024, we want to use cropping. We want to make sure that we're in the horizontal shift speed of 30 megahertz uh, instead of 10 megahertz. And uh, we can bin the camera if we can get away with that reduction in resolution. And uh, finally, we can adjust the vertical shift speed from the normal, which is 2.2, and the vertical clock voltage from the normal to respectively 0.6 microseconds and plus one. Uh, and that can help us go faster. Though these um, vertical clock voltages and vertical shift speeds here in the advanced camera settings, I would only go there as sort of a last recourse. Uh, really, um, the main uh, improvements in speed can be had without having to go uh, into those settings. So as you've probably gleaned uh, from the, the various things that I went over, there are a lot of settings to keep track of. Um, what I will do is create a table that shows you the expected frame rates for different common combinations of these settings. What I've outlined here is sort of things you can do, but I will have uh, common scenarios tabulated um, so that you can, you know, based on your desired frame rate, figure out how to get there by using um, various control options.